This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you courtesy of Michelob Ultra Beer. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of What's Working. I'm Cam Marston, your host. Thank you so much for joining along. I hope what we've prepared for you this week is something that you can utilize. The goal of the show, as you probably already know, if you're a regular listener, workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends shaping Alabama business. We try to find guests that can teach us something that we can utilize to make us a little bit better at whatever it is that we do. Whether we can apply it at our home, we can apply it at our school, we can apply it at our business, whatever the situation may be, our goal is to get better and get better through the guests that we have on the show. Again, welcome. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. Before we get into the content of today's show, let's give you a quick update. Number one, we got a new advertiser on board. I want to spend a moment thanking GetTheTea.com, the tea that makes you go. And it's uh, meant for an active lifestyle, helps maintain your health, cleanse your body from intruders, helps maintain uh, ideal body weight, etc. You'll hear their ads on the podcast version, not on the broadcast version, but on the podcast version of this show, which leads me to where to find that podcast ver- version, What's whatsworkingcam.com. I'm happy to say that the downloads continue to increase. It's nice to see people reacting to that. And I think there's been a a, a triggering effect from our collaboration with Business Alabama Magazine. We're now advertising in that magazine. And I think people interested in business across the state are seeing that advertisement and finding the podcast. And if that's you that I'm talking to, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. The book that I've written most recently is called What Works. It's available on my website, but you can get a chapter of it by signing up on the website. The bottom of the homepage, the homepage is cammarston.com. The bottom of the homepage, you'll find places to sign up. And once you sign up and hit enter into your inbox, magically appears chapter one of my book called What Works. It's a summary of the 10 best ideas I've heard in the first 200 episodes of the show. Not the 10 best episodes, the 10 best ideas I've heard in the first 200 episodes of the show. So I think you'll find that interesting. It's an easy read. I wrote it in such a way that you can get through it very quickly and pull out the ideas and apply them to your uh, to your workplace in a very short amount of time. If you want a copy of the book, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on my website. There are plenty of places to do it. Now, enough of that. That's called the preamble. I'm really good at the preamble. What I'm bad at is the amble. Here we go. We're ambling. One of the technologies that I think is, as, as I've learned and will emphasize as we go along here in the show, that's ubiquitous is this RFID technology. I don't know about it, but I, as I've learned about it and begun preparing for today's interview, I've realized that this technology is in places that were all around me that I had no idea. And I'll give you an example. We'll talk about this when I get this guy on the phone here momentarily. Um I get on an airplane, and that part of my world has increased recently, thankfully, but I love being in these places. I don't particularly care for getting to these places. Um, But one of the things that makes it easier is this app on my phone. I fly primarily Delta, and I can look on the app and figure out where my luggage is. If I've checked the luggage, it will tell me exactly, and to the point of there's a function on the app that allows me to see where it is in the airport and where it's moving and where it's moved from. It's pretty cool. I don't use it all that much because I only use it when things have gone wrong. But uh, and, and thankfully, I haven't had those bad luck scenarios recently. Knock on wood. I'm knocking on wood. Um, 
but you can see the luggage moving and it's easy to find your luggage in those rare occasions that the luggage is lost, at least in my experience, rare occasions that luggage is lost in my experience flying, flying Delta Airlines. Now, I just thought there are people down there managing this in the bowels of the airplanes and the bowels of the airport. There are people around there managing this type of thing. I had no idea how they did it. You don't question these things if they work. And uh, I just learned and will learn and have learned as I've looked over the website uh, uh, that this is an RFID technology that's helping me on a regular basis. Now, my suspicion is there are many more. And we'll figure out how uh, our lives, our world is being influenced by it any given moment of the day. And I think we're in for a treat when we come back from break. Justin Patton, he oversees the RFID lab at Auburn University. I was introduced to him as a guy that's on some cutting edge stuff that will appeal to the business listener. Folks, if you have an inventory part of your business... I think this one's going to be for you. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be back after this break. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. The Alabama Center for Real Estate, better known as ACRE, housed at the University of Alabama's Culver House College of Business, is committed to industry engagement and dedicated to shaping the future of real estate through excellence in teaching, research, and service to drive economic and workforce development in Alabama. Acre in Alabama, a championship collaboration. Learn more at www.acre.culverhouse.ua.edu. I'd like you to meet my new sponsor, Get the Tea. They carry all natural, non-GMO, organic herbal cleansing teas and supplements. They source their ingredients from the purest available. Your health is an investment that's worthwhile, so why wait? I drink their tea each and every day to help keep my digestive system in check. I'm drinking a glass as I record this right now. It comes in three flavors, natural, peppermint, and pomegranate. I'm drinking the peppermint. All of their products are made right here in the USA. Go to getthetea.com and enter code CAM5, that's C-A-M-5, to receive $5 off your first order. That's getthetea.com, code CAM5. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. On the line with me, Justin Patton. I'm going to read his bio here. We'll dip in and out of his bio as we go in and out of these different segments with Justin on the line. Justin oversees the RFID Lab at Auburn University, a research institute focused on the business case and technical implementation of RFID and other emergence, emerging technologies and retail. He's participated in most of the seminal business case research for RFID in the United States. Justin, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to What's Working. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. I think you're on to something that my listeners will find uh, a, of interest. We've got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. Let's begin with the table stakes of definitions. RFID, what exactly is it? Where do I encounter it on any given day? RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification, and you're probably never more than about 10 feet from an RFID tag in your life. Uh, it's everything from um, your hotel room key cards that you use to get into a hotel room, uh, the keys that we use for our vehicles to start the ignition and open the doors. Um, if you have a dog or a cat, it's the chip that they put in there for uh, identity for those animals. If you go down to Disney World, they use them for the wristbands to get in and out of the parks. Uh, concerts, um, use RFID, uh, race timing for uh, any types of marathons, athletic events. NFL puts RFID tags on uh, football players and in the footballs uh, during games for tracking stats and things like that. So um, RFID is literally everywhere. It's one of those invisible technologies that just kind of work and we don't think about directly as much, but uh, is always there. So if I were to hold my hand out to you and you were to put RFID in my hand, what would it look like? <laughs> That's a great question. So uh, an RFID tag is typically a little 2D sticker. Um, it kind of looks like a little squiggly silver antenna, um, and it has a small chip in the middle of it. So it's designed at about the size of a barcode a lot of times, and sometimes they're a little bigger. 
Um, but the idea, it is a, a radio-based um, um, technology that works a lot like a barcode does, but instead of shooting a laser at something to identify it, we shoot a, a radio wave at that item, and then it bounces off that RFID tag and identifies what that item is. So the tag itself does not require power to be working. It does not require a source of energy, this little item in, let's say, an NFL football. It does not need a battery to make it operational. Some do and some don't. There's there's two different types. There's active RFID, which has a battery on board, and then there's passive RFID, which has no battery. So if you look at, like, the NFL systems, um, they use an active RFID. It does have a small uh, uh, battery in there. There's one in, in the player's shoulder pads and one in the ball. Um, another example of active RFID um, you may have experience with is uh, um, uh, Apple has these new AirTags. Uh, it's a tag that you can put in your um, luggage or bag oh, or whatever yeah, to yeah. find it. Mm-hmm. And um, Tile, some people may be familiar with yeah. Tile. Uh, it's a Bluetooth technology, but that's active RFID. And, then, and Passive um, has no battery on there. A lot of times when people talk about RFID, they're talking about uh, Passive RFID, which is what you would see for retail stores for uh, counting things and taking inventory or airline baggage tracking and things like that. What is Auburn's role? Were you all responsible for creating the technology or are you has the technology existed and Auburn is finding new ways to utilize it? Um, the technology existed. We've just been getting lucky for many, many years. I think uh, what happened is in 2005, uh, the RFID lab was founded and we were at the University of Arkansas then. And um, that was when Walmart did their first big ca- kickoff with pallet level and case level RFID for supply chain. And they needed the university to help educate folks and do research to drive that forward. And then um, in 2014, well, the founder of the RFID lab was Dr. Bill Hargrave. And um, he became the dean of the business college here at Auburn in 2010. We moved the whole lab from Arkansas to Auburn to join him here in 2014. And then uh, he became provost. And uh, as of a few months ago, he became the president of the University of Memphis. So we have uh, uh, continued to kind of follow the trends in the industry with the technology. But Auburn, uh, I've been doing this job for 17 years now. And Auburn's role is to be an advocate, is to educate people on how it works, do a lot of research into how to solve um, problems, particularly for people who are having big supply chain issues, and most importantly, crank out the students that are going to go work in the new industry. We want to have the best in the business when it comes to RFID. Um, we want to be the place to go to get students who know exactly how that works. I want to talk to you about the students as we move along to learn what types of careers and opportunities may be available to them once they come through your program. On your website, it's under the sponsor uh, page, whatever. Uh, you guys got some remarkable brands that are sponsoring your research, I would guess. I'll read a couple of them. Boeing, Delta, FedEx, Hanes, T-shirts, clothing, uh, Nike. You got a big swoosh on there. Target, T-Mobile. Tell me what you're doing for these organizations. So a lot of them are using RFID in their daily operations. And what they do is they need a little bit of help figuring out what kinds of RFID tags to use and where to put them on those items. So there's some physics to it, right? Uh, Radio waves have uh, some issues with metal and water and things like that. So we need to help figure out where do you actually put an RFID tag on a a piece of a landing gear uh, component or where do we put an RFID tag on a bottle of shampoo or something like that. So from a research side, we help with the pure physics of it. Uh, But then I think uh, the bigger picture is um, they need to know what we can do with serialized data. We're really changing the way that we're tracking and using things globally as humans. Uh, We've all seen that since COVID came along and really changed the way that we do retail shopping and travel. And they're all trying to figure out what is the future of shared data identity for all these items and and who is somebody from a, a thought leadership and research perspective that can kind of help guide that. What do, so that we help fill that role as well. What does that mean, though? C- serialize uh, data. Tell me what that looks like. I'm, I, 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 I beg you to be patient with me. I'm an arts and sciences graduate. So um, slowly, please. What does that mean? Sure. So most people deal with things on a count basis. So the question I love to ask people is, let me ask you this, Cam. How many pairs of shoes do you own? 
Oh, so we're real life here, real life. Uh, so not real metaphorically. Life. I'm going to say I own ten pairs of shoes. Ten? Yes, or you know? It's a guess. Yes, right. So we tend to live in a little bit of a fog as people as to how much of everything we have around us. We, we tend to think of things in terms of the number of things that we have, but we don't actually know. I mean, if you ask someone like, how many plates do you have? How many shoes do you have? You ask someone, how many things do you have in your house that cost over a thousand dollars? These are questions that you would think you would know off the top of your head. And we, a lot of times don't. Humans are not awesome at inventory tracking or counting things. So the same holds true in, in supply chain and retail. Um, everybody's been to a store and you look on the shelf and something's not there and you look on the website and it says they're supposed to have two. And what do you do? Oh, it's not right. It's not here. Maybe it's in the back room. Maybe it's not. Maybe I go somewhere else. So, so in the past, mainly we have dealt with inventory systems that are focused on account by unit type. It's called quantity accounting. What we're moving towards in the future is every single item, every single thing has its own serialized identity so that when we count things, we're keeping track of how many specific units we have. So if something goes missing, we know exactly which one. Or if we need to count things we have, it's easier to count when we know exactly what their name and what their type is and not just a guess of how many. So when you say guess of how many, I'm looking at the the sponsor side on your website, the Hanes brand. So you'd be able to say we have a thousand of this exact T-shirt in this size. Mm -hmm. And and, and it's it's that specific, not just a thousand T-shirts, but a thousand extra large white T-shirts are sitting in that box over there. And that's what the Mm -hmm. RFID is able to do. Absolutely. And they will do it by package. So it'll be like if it's a three pack of white t-shirts and it will say, here's a box and there's a thousand size, you know, large white t-shirts in a three pack. And it will not only say that it will say, and this is package number 1001. And this is package number 1002. This is package number 1003. So every single package has its own unique ID. So have you ever, I'm sorry, go ahead. Have you ever worked in a, um, retail store like as a college job or high school job or anything like have you ever checked anybody out for anything uh not really no i know what you're asking but no not in a not in a formal sense like what you're asking but i i'm sure you've gone to the store before and you bought like five boxes of cereal right sure so what do they normally do they scan all five boxes or do they just kind of scan one and type it in right? scan one type it in right exactly so because all of those cereal boxes have the same barcode for the same type the change is every single unit would have its own serial identity behind it. So mm-hmm. it would be specific to the unit. That's extraordinary, the amount of data that requires and the amount of tracking that requires. And I want to talk to you a little bit because I'm uh, when we come back from break about who's – I had this guy on the show a couple of years ago named Brian Reese, and he was on there talking about artificial intelligence. And he was uh, he was addressing the concern that I had at the time that artificial intelligence is going to take jobs away. And I can't help mm-hmm. but think somebody in the inventory system at Hanes at the grocery store is losing a job due to this RFID technology. And uh, whether I'm right about that, let's address that when we come back from break. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm on the line. Justin Patton, he oversees the RFID lab at Auburn University. We're talking about the way they count things and the significance of it and the serializing of items. When we come back from break, he and I are going to get into the workplace implications of this. You're listening to What's Working, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. Be right back. Sitting with Cajun Mike, owner E3 Termite and Pest Control. Cajun Mike, there are people I know that think their house is fully protected because there are some bait stations around the house. What's your thoughts? My thought personally is uh, bait stations do work. However, I do not believe in them as a standalone product. What else do they need? We do three, four, sometimes five or six treatments on the house. We will do a true liquid perimeter treatment. We do hollow void treatments, and we use boar care on wood when we can access it. It's a thorough treatment, top to bottom, it sounds like, much more so than the bait station. That is correct. How do they find you, Cajun Mike? They can find me at 251-850-PEST or E3PEST.com. E3PEST.com. We're 
you're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm on the line with Justin Patton. He's participated in the most of the seminal business cases research for RFID in the United States. He knows his business and has been chasing it through Auburn University. Most recently, you're listening to What's Working, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. Justin, prior to break, we were talking about uh, this technology, and it is likely somebody's losing a job due to the technology. It's more sophisticated. You're able to do more counting in shorter amount of time. There was some dude that used to stand there with a barcode scanner to do inventory, and he'd hit, he'd scan each one of these uh, barcodes. And now you're doing that same amount of work in minutes, if not seconds. And this guy's become redundant, him and his little barcode scanner. Am I any way near the truth here? Uh, Am I on to something or tell me what I don't understand? I think that we're um, looking at it from a different angle. So you probably noticed this, but people's expectations of inventory accuracy are much, much higher. And people's expectations of when they're supposed to get something are much faster than when they used to be. You remember back in the 80s when I was you would watch TV commercials and you would have somebody selling something that had that little blue screen that would come on the end and say, allow four to six weeks for delivery. <laughs> right. Yes, I, mean, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so if you told somebody they were going to get something in four to six weeks that they ordered online, they'd be floored. They'd cancel it and order it from somewhere else. We want it in one to two days. Right. And I think uh, most people experienced this too during COVID. Not many people had done buy online, pick up in store before everything shut down on the other side of that. Almost everybody's going to buy online pickup. Have you ever done like a, an online grocery order to drive down to the store and pick it up? I have. I have. And we're big fans of shipped here in our household. Every Sunday we have a shipped order coming through the door. Very good. So think about it from this perspective. If you go to a grocery store and you fill up and pile up a basket full of groceries and you go up to the uh, cashier to barcode scout all your things out, how long does it take that cashier to uh, count everything in your um, grocery basket? Uh, depends <laughs> Depends on how hungry my four teenagers have been that week, but it can take a little while. It could take, let's say, five minutes, yep. right? Five to ten minutes, all right? Now, think about this other way. If you sit home and you do a buy online pickup order for that same basket full of groceries, someone is going out there to pick all of that stuff up off the shelf for you and put it in your basket. So that's not five to ten minutes. You're talking about 30 to 45 minutes to pull a whole order. So what's happening is the way that we're selling and shipping and picking things now is taking much, much, much more labor than it did before. In the old days, they put stuff on the shelf. You walk in the store, you either got it or you didn't, and then you would go up to a cashier and they check you out and you go home. Nowadays, we're using a lot of the labor from the stores and the restaurants to go out there and help fill a lot of the roles that we as consumers and shoppers used to do ourselves. So what's happening is labor demands and labor requirements across the board are much higher than they used to be. So what we're trying to do is to shore up that inventory, make it more accurate, take some time pressure off the amount of time that we wander, we spend wandering around counting things and use that same time to actually pick and fill orders. So it's not removing um, time requirements. It's actually simplifying it. The, the, the labor demands are going up. What we're trying to do is help them repurpose that labor into something that's going to help serve the, the customer or something that's going to help fill the order and not spend it on all the prep time just to get the inventory right to make sure that we don't pull, pull a bad order to begin with. So you're not you're not eliminating people from the workforce. This technology is is asking them to do something different, a different task during the day, let's say, than what they would have been doing historically. The technology is asking them to retrain themselves into something new. We're going back to the old days. Like when retail used to be, especially in the early you know, 1900s or up until kind of the, the latter half of the 20th century, a lot of retail was very customer focused. It was, you would have cashiers, you would have store associates, they would stand behind the counter, they would get you what you want, they would help you with your shopping experience, they would help you with purchases. And then we kind of got away with, from that in the, the late 20th century and we put people into these roles where they were walking around with uh, a barcode scanners or just counting things on the shelf all the time and they weren't useful, they weren't helping the customer, they were just helping get the store square with the expectation that the customer is going to go do all that work themselves. I think what we're trying to do is get back to where we were and use the people in the stores to actually help customers 
and not use them to just serve the, the back end inventory systems that we built over time. And um, that's a good thing. I think everybody wants a better shopping experience. Everybody wants their things faster. Everybody wants a little bit more of a helping hand when they go in there. And quite frankly, I don't think you'll talk to a retailer out there who doesn't have to add more hours and add more labor to make that happen. So, so the labor market is very healthy. Yeah. So they were the customer. This is a good point. The customers were were had been or I'm sorry. The employees on the floor had been customer facing. They then turned and became inventory facing, leaving the customers to figure it out themselves. Today, they're turning back to become customer facing due to the technology that you've uh, created and continue to enhance. We've talked about the application of this technology in the retail environment, and I can very easily see it there. How is it working with Delta? How is it working with Boeing? Delta is a great success story. So one of the greatest frustrations with air travel is lost bags, right? Everybody hates when their bag gets lost. Um, what we started doing years ago is um, when you check a bag, they'll put that big strip on your checked bag. It has a barcode on there. Yep. And then as it's processed through the loading process and then on the aircraft and off the baggage carousel, somebody scans that barcode to say where it is, where it's been, so on and so forth. Um, RFID is a natural fit because what it does is we put an RFID tag in that side strip label And then whenever that um, bag of luggage goes down a conveyor line, whenever it's actually being loaded onto the aircraft, that RFID tag scans automatically. So no one has to pull out a handheld barcode scanner. So we get continuous real-time monitoring on where those bags are, what aircraft they've been loaded in, what time they've been loaded in. And then more importantly, when somebody's bag does get lost and they walk into a room full of 57 maroon roller bags that all look exactly the same, they don't have to walk around looking at numbers on each one. They can pull out an RFID scanner and it'll say, oh, it's this one right over here in the corner that we pull it back out of there. So it is much more accurate, much faster and a better experience for all of the passengers and, and a lot less pressure on the baggage handlers. Uh, to constantly um, visually verify and barcode scan that stuff over and over again. So you guys or somebody, some manufacturer out there is making RFID tags in the millions. And the cost of making this small uh, piece of electronics versus the cost of a barcode, it's got to be more expensive to print these things. I'm sure there are extraordinary efficiencies of scale. But talk to me about the cost of the technology versus the cost of the historic traditional barcode technology. Sure. So a cost of a barcode is, you know, printed paper and ink, right? Yeah. So a cost of an RFID tag, passive UHF RFID tag, if you buy them in volume, uh, it's going to be four to five cents a piece. Now, if you're talking about a $500 handbag, that's not a problem. If you're talking about a jar of pickles, now that blows your whole margin. So we're never going to put RFID tags on everything. I think RFID is a complement to barcodes and some of the new computer vision-based technologies, but it's not necessarily a versus conversation. It's an also. So, but I think um, in terms of volumes, I can tell you now, last year, in 2022, there are about 30 billion RFID tags uh, purchased and placed on products uh, around the world. Uh, next year, we're moving up to about 50 billion units, so it's almost doubling. Um, and that trend continues. Um, supply chain has been real messed up, and everybody's trying to get a better handle on inventory. So this has been a little bit of a boom time. So even though they do cost a little bit more, typically the amount of value and efficiency that they unlock offsets the uh, cost of the, the RFID tag itself. So we've got about two minutes before the next break. Give me a sense of when your phone rings from one of these major real t- retailers or manufacturers and they are looking for ideas. T- give me a sense of what they're looking for from you. Are, are there some forward thinking ideas out there? We, we hear what's in place. What's on the horizon? Who's calling you, asking you to help them with this technology? Lots of supply chain folks. I mean, ever since COVID hit, it's been like there's a giant toddler with a giant lever just pulling the supply chain backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Stuff's backed up. It's sitting in ports. It's sitting in warehouses. We don't know how much we have. We don't know where it is. I mean, there's outages. I mean, if any of you have any teenagers out there, those PlayStation 5s, they've been out of stock for a year and a half almost. So everything is not quite where we want it to be. So most people call us and say, 
I have a problem. I don't know how much inventory I have. I don't know where my inventory is. I have to solve this. I cannot be using a paper-based ASN anymore where I'm just looking at a bill of lading and checking this stuff off. How do I, how do I get with a, a little bit more of a modern solution to help solve this? And, and that's where I think a lot of our conversations start. Let's go to break. And when we come back, I want to hear about what the, what the future of this looks like. And Lynn, let's talk about the students, how they're learning, what they're learning, and what it's positioning them for when they come out on the other side of your program. You're listening to What's Working on the Line with Justin Patton. He's with the RFID Lab at Auburn University. Quite a remarkable uh, resume and experience dealing with this technology. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. We'll be back after this break. The Alabama Center for Real Estate, known as ACRE, strives every day to be a valued resource that supports and promotes Alabama's real estate industry and promotes economic and workforce development across the great state of Alabama. Acre and Alabama, a championship collaboration. Get to know Acre and learn more about their offerings and their events at their website, www.acre.culverhouse.ua.edu. Customer service never goes out of style. In fact, I think it's safe to say that customer service is more valuable and more important now more than ever. Hi, this is Cam Marston. One thing that my over 200 episodes of What's Working has taught me is how important customer service is to building and maintaining a thriving business. It's the growing need for customer service that's led me to partner with one of the state's leading customer service trainers to create our program called Delivering Five Star Customer Service. Your team will get one 90-minute training session per month for six consecutive months. Each session builds on the skills learned the previous month, allowing your customer-facing teams to practice before moving on to the next lesson. And the six lessons address everything from appearance to electronic communications to conflict resolution to maintaining a service mindset. Our program travels and is delivered in person at your workplace. Nothing virtual. You simply can't practice the level of the skills this course teaches virtually. For more information, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's schedule a time to talk. Remember, you have less to fear from outside competition than you do from discourtesy and bad service from inside your own company. Again, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's talk about your business. I'm on the line with Justin Patton. He's at the RFID Lab, Auburn University. You're listening to What's Working, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate and the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. Justin and I have been having a really interesting conversation about a technology that's nearly ubiquitous, but I didn't hardly know about. It's all around me. And in fact, the fact that my bag came out of the luggage carousel last night here in Mobile and I could look on the app, my Delta app on my phone and know that it was coming, I suspect, Justin, is a, uh, is owed to, thanks to, the RFID technology that Delta is using in their barcode things that go on the side of my bag. Am I correct? That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's one of the primary uses. So mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about what the students in your program are learning, what they're coming out on the other side of the program with, and who's hiring them. So the students are what makes this run. So right now we have four full-time um, you know, research and staff, and then we have 92 students. Um, so we try to make the students run the whole show as much as we can. We have grad, we have undergrad, we have PhD, we got some from business, we got some from engineering, we got some from human science, I got animal science in here, we've got people putting RFID tags on oysters in the past, it's, it's everything. So um, our goal is to take these students and to give them some real world experience. You get a lot of education in the university and you do some programs and co-ops and stuff like that. But what if you could take a student and pair them up with a company like a McDonald's or like a Boeing or like a Walmart and actually have them work on a project together for months at a time? They build a network. They're ready to go. They graduate. They go out there. They're ready to hit the market at full stride and full speed. And we're really proud of that. We feel like uh, we're cranking out some students that not just have RFID experience, 
but have real world work experience to help them engage more quickly whenever they get out into the, the workforce. This is a school of business uh, class, I'm guessing. These classes are in the school of business. The, the lab is moving to an institute model. So when we moved here in 2014, it was with support of engineering, business, and human sciences and the, the College of the Vice Provost of Research, or the Office of the Vice Provost of Research. So it's a collaboration between all of those different colleges. It takes all, all of them. Um, but um, we are officially housed in the, in the Harvard College of Business, absolutely. Yeah. But we need them all. Yeah. I've learned to use the term housed as a, in reference to universities and departments and things like that. If you've not heard the intro and exit from each segment, the university housed mm-hmm. at the Culver House College of Business. It's, it wasn't a term familiar to me till I started dabbling in your world a little bit of the university. So, um, What's the future look like this stuff, Justin? What, what's going to blow my mind? There's somebody out there thinking non-traditionally about this technology. What's going to blow my mind in three years when you and I connect on the phone again and you tell me, here's what's just happened? I think the biggest thing that we're going to see a change in right now is food. Um, right now in the U.S., about 30% of the food that goes to the supply chain is thrown away or wasted. It expires. It goes to the wrong place. We don't use it, whatever it may be. And that's pretty wasteful. We could be much more efficient at that. If we are more efficient, it makes it cheaper for everybody because we don't have to pay for all the stuff we're throwing away. And more than that, it's just a good thing to do to be more responsible with how we use food. So what's happening now is there's also some federal requirements that are coming back for finding out, um, being able to recall food for safety issues and things like that. Somebody gets E. coli at a restaurant or something, they want to be able to trace that back through. It's called the Food Safety Modernization Act. All these things are coming together and the whole restaurant industry is moving into a mode of using RFID for case level tracking for produce, uh, meat, uh, everything all the way back to the source so that we can do quality, we can do recalls, we can do supply chain efficiency. That's going to translate into lower costs at the grocery store for consumers. It's going to translate into lower costs at the restaurants. It's going to uh, translate into greater food availability for everyone, less waste. So I think that's the biggest short-term impact. And and when I say short-term, it's probably within the next five years that we're all going to see is a new way to look at food supply chain beyond just pushing a whole bunch of stuff through and hoping it doesn't go bad. So I'm going to, I'm going to make some conclusions here. I'm imagining I'm hovering over a, a green field somewhere in the, the, the Valley of central Valley of California. And as people are picking things, strawberries, spinach, lettuce, they're putting them in boxes, and those boxes are being tagged with an RFID, which gives you the exact GPS location, time, and date that these things were put in that box. Am I right? Absolutely. And if you look out there, there's a press release that came out a few months ago from Chipotle, and that's kind of what they're doing uh, with uh, avocados, things like that, fruit. So those things are picked in the field. They're put in a box or crate. We can track that box or crate through the supply chain. And then when we receive it at the restaurant location, then they can receive it more accurately. If anybody's ever worked in a restaurant, especially for receiving, the truck pulls up, they start throwing stuff off the back, it goes into the cooler. Nobody has time to sit there and write down all the numbers on all those boxes that are coming through the door. They're in a hurry. So they hope they get it right, but sometimes they don't. And then we hope that we know exactly what's in that cooler and, and what the date and what the time frame it's been on. But sometimes it's not easy to take time out of the day to go through there and, and scan that or write that stuff down. So the RF system is going to automate that process, making sure that as they drop those things off, they know exactly what they have when they get it, just like your bag that came off that that line at Delta whenever you received it. And then even in the cooler in the back room, someone can quickly scan that inventory and say, ah, this stuff is about to expire. We need to use it. This stuff needs to be thrown away. We need to order more of that. It's allowing us to count more frequently in times when we never could before and allowing us to uh, make sure that we're not putting unsafe stuff out there and increase the, the quality and decrease the cost of the things that we are putting out there for consumers. So the question that I hesitate to ask, and I've held back on it because we only have four minutes of the show, and I've, and I've held back to the, to the last part of the interview because I feel like it's Pandora's box and I don't know how to handle it. RFID plus blockchain. Go. Okay, so blockchain is tends to be one of those business terms that tends to be widely overused. Um, so a lot of people looked at blockchain and just took uh, 
their old website that talked about cloud computing and just changed the word on there and put it back out there. So I think that at its core, the idea of blockchain is having a distributed ledger or a shared record of what something is and where it is that everyone can access without having to go ping off somebody's server or database. And I think what that does is it potentially offers us a lot of opportunities for this shared data. I don't really care if it's blockchain. I don't care if it's a cloud server system. I don't care if it's their own managed database. It doesn't really matter to us in the RFID world, the serialized data world. I think that blockchain will have a big play there, but I feel like sometimes that term is overused or, or misused uh, to um, indicate things that are uh, very different um, depending on what the context is. But I do feel like blockchain does focus on that idea of, of shared identity, which is the core of what we're trying to get at here with uh, the RFID lab. So I just want to make sure that the education level gets up and people learn how to use that, I think, more responsibly going forward. Oh, I'm one of the irresponsible users of it. You should <laughs> point at me because it, it reminds me of that Seinfeld episode back in the day where uh, Kramer just said they just write it off. And he doesn't wasn't really sure what that expression meant. But, oh, these corporations, <laughs> they just write it all off. And he didn't know what it meant. And I'm kind of the same way. Oh, they'll, they'll you know, the blockchain will take care of that. My coffee isn't mm -hmm. hot this morning in the hotel. Well, that's a blockchain issue. And I don't know how to use the word. But when you say it with confidence, people just nod and say, you know what? I think you're probably right. But you know, they know less than I do. You know what? You just nailed it on the head. I never thought of it. But people use that word like a bucket, right? So everything goes in it. Uh, so that's exactly it. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't know the blockchain if you put it on my lap. But it is a good <laughs> answer for nearly everything. Um, mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by this, and it's really neat what you guys are doing there. And there may be somebody out there listening that says, hey, gosh, I need some of this help. And, you know, Alabama's great at producing peanuts. We had a guy in the peanut producing business here not long ago on the show. We need some of this for our blank. and Or uh, a parent wants their child. Hey, this is the future. Boy, go and learn more about the RFID. With, you're at Auburn. Go knock on his door. How can people find out more about you? How can they reach out to you? RFID lab at auburn.edu. Um, and uh, that's our, our email address where most people come to to, to uh, connect with us. We have some social media out there as well, so you can find us on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. But that email address is always the most direct. And the lab here is big. It's about 15,000 square feet. We do tours almost every day. It's free. So I'm happy to show people this stuff too, if they ever want to get through and see it for themselves. I think once, uh, at least like me, once you begin the conversation, you begin to realize this, like, like I said earlier, it's a ubiquitous technology, which is a, a phrase that I stole off your website. Um, and I was unfamiliar with how much my world is already being shaped by it and beginning to see using what you've told me. Uh, that that it's only really just begun. Is that about right? That's it. It was just the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, great to talk to you. Nice to know that it's out there. Justin Patton oversees the RFID lab at Auburn University. One of the nation's, I would say, premier researchers as well as implementers of this technology based on what I've heard from him as well as seen on their website. State of Alabama, folks, has these wonderful gold mines of expertise, and this is yet another one. Just, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Sure. Thank you. Justin is available. You can find him at RFID Lab. Say that again. Website again for me, Justin. It's RFID Lab at Auburn.edu. There we go. You can find more about him here. We'll be back in a moment with segment five with the recap and some insights on what's upcoming. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. <laughs> I'd like you to meet my new sponsor, Get The Tea. They carry all natural, non-GMO, organic herbal cleansing teas and supplements. They source their ingredients from the purest available. Your health is an investment that's worthwhile, so why wait? I drink their tea each and every day to help keep my digestive system in check. I'm drinking a glass as I record this right now. It comes in three flavors, natural, peppermint, and pomegranate. I'm drinking the peppermint. All of their products are made right here in the USA. Go to GetTheTea.com and enter code CAM5, that's C-A-M-5, to receive $5 off your first order. That's GetTheTea.com, code CAM5.
This is Cam Marston in the studio with Cajun Mike. Cajun Mike, what's going on at E3 Pest Control? What you guys doing today that's different? Well, what we're doing different is we are treating homes that have spray foam installation, and we're able to give them a full bond, whereas other companies are not able to. How does the treatment work with the spray foam? Basically, we, we spray the spray foam with bore care. Bore care absorbs into the spray foam. It prevents termites from landing on it and creating an above-ground carton. Is there any restrictions or limits to how you can do this, or is it any home with spray foam? Basically, any home with spray foam. How do they find you, Cajun Mike? Find me at 251-850-7378 or e3pest.com. That's e3pest.com. Uh, that was fascinating. Really. Uh, the, the, the the implications of this technology as it becomes more and more ubiquitous, which is a word I haven't used this many times in a long time, as it becomes more ubiquitous are interesting. And we won't see it in our daily lives. Our lives will be enhanced. They'll be made better a little bit. Uh, but we won't see this technology. It'll just be influencing the outcome. What's working? We're back. It's Cam Marston. What's working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. Big thanks to Justin Patton. And folks, as a guy that interviews people quite frequently, Justin's a good interview. He gets right into the meat of the answer. There's no preamble. I got preamble problems. He has no preamble issues. He jumps right into the meat of the answer. Uh, he has very few non-words, no ands and ums and you knows and stuff like that, which is a chronic problem of my own. He was a treat, a very uh, a, a treat to interview. He got he says he does it frequently, and uh, I can see that he does it frequently, and he's learned and delivers a great uh, interview. It's remarkable. I, I guess, and this is something that we saw, my wife and I saw when our daughter toured Ole Miss, and she, which is where she is now a student. These universities that are really preparing their students to be bottom line contributors to employers the day they graduate from school. And I'm sure each workplace has some training and ramp up that's necessary. They have to. Uh, it's a part of learning the culture and the way things go. The unofficial parts of the workplace, uh, you got to get trained and learn it in time. But uh, Ole Miss was very proud of this when our daughter toured, and they were very clear about that. And I'm hearing this from uh, what we just heard from Justin. And then a few weeks ago, it seems like I've got this Auburn bias going on, but these stories have landed in my lap a few weeks ago with the uh, School of Aviation at Auburn and how uh, they've created a track that are getting students into the workplace and contributors fairly quickly. It wasn't as big of a deal, I don't remember, uh, when I was leaving school. And it may be because I was a liberal arts major, and the only thing I was qualified to do upon graduating from college was ask, would you like fries with your order? And I love my liberal arts degree, but it took quite a bit of training to get me ready for the workplace. So what's coming up? You may be interested. What's coming up? I had a great call with Lane Zerlot not long ago. You may remember his name, Murder Point Oysters. We'll have Lane on in the near future, trying to get his calendar and mind scheduled. And I want to be in the studio with him. We've done it over the phone in the past. We'll get an update on Murder Point, one of my favorite interviews ever. Lane Zerlot coming up. So find the show at whatsworkingcam.com. You can email me directly off that page. I hope you'll search me out on social media where we post about the show and the guests and things perhaps that we're looking for, guests that we're looking for, ideas that we're looking for. Would love to have your contributions there. Many people are communicating with me through those channels for which I'm grateful. Please don't hesitate. You can email at me at any given moment, cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. That's my website, cammarston.com, where you can see the seminars and the workshops that we do, things of that nature that uh, are coming back, gratefully, coming back now. Let's see what the economy does to them, but they're coming back. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. John Thompson with Eye on Digital is the show's producer. Every time I say that, it's a day he cannot go drink beer on the north side of Horn Island because he's editing my show. We'll have another show next week, everybody. Have a good week.